In 2015, uh, I met Gary again, and we're sitting down and uh, looking at the assembly in New York, where the whole community signed in for the 17 goals. And um, you know these 17 goals. Yeah. And we were asking each other the question, it's wonderful, but let us try to answer one question. Where does the money come from in order to finance all these goals? And second, how much money is required to finance them? It's a relevant question. Because we have a political consensus on these goals, almost 100% on the globe, and we have a lot of scientific evidence for each of the goals and the sub-goals. If you go into details, you will see there's huge evidence on how to set up preschooling and how to set up access to healthcare, etc., etc. We all got that from a scientific perspective done, and we also have the technology out there. But there's one question we were not able to really answer is, how much money do you need and where does it come from? Because if you're not able to answer as a world community that question, the whole debate on the SDGs, which was actually the longest debate the UN ever uh, exercised up front, is in vain. It will remain a philosophical debate about peace and love and sustainability, etc., which is nice, but which was not the initial purpose. So I want to run with you first to four preliminary empirical statements and findings. The background is that WAS is running an initiative on this question on how to finance SDGs, and I'm just the spokesperson of that, right? Second, I will show you what are the traditional ways of doing it and why there is something missing. And then I'm, at the end, I'm going to summarize our current state where we are. Okay. You don't have to download it. I'm going to send you the stuff. If you need references, I have a backup office. I have a lot of people being involved. Okay, first of general statements. You know, we're living in a new era called the Anthropocene, as you know. Okay, this is a publication from the British Royal Society of Science. Just, you don't, gotta, don't, don't go into details, just look at these gray graphs, they all show everything is exponential. And li living the Anthropocene means living in an age where everything is <coughs> connected with each other, and every, we have to operate with the planetary boundaries, and we create a lot of human-specific exponential feedback loops we have to cope with. This is basically changing everything. The thing we're doing in business, we think we're doing politics. The thing we feed ourselves, we educate our children. Our private mobility, the way we live, and also the way we do finance. Second short statement. If you look from your side on the left, you see that triangle. This is the triangle in sustainability that is basically pre the prevailing figure in order to understand how to go towards a more sustainable pathway. It's always in the past about reconciling the social world, the economic world, and the ecological world. But this picture in our brain is misleading. We have to look at the whole process from a different perspective. It's more like a funnel where at its core is the financial sector or the design of the money system in general that determines the very rest. Third preliminary statement. When we're talking about finance, we basically talk, have to get the figures right, okay? So if you talk about SDGs, the figure of five trillion were on the table already which is roughly the figure we're talking about. We're not talking about the billions, we're talking about the T word, okay? So whenever there's possibilities out there saying, well, we need a bond or a fund or some charity, it's all fine, but we're talking about the T word, okay? Three, four, five trillions. If you in include public infrastructures even more, it's seven to nine. And this graph just shows you 
what we're talking about. We have a global GDP of 70 to 80 trillion. Okay, we have a shadow economy of 35 trillion. We have a disaster management component within the GDP of 25 trillion. So at the moment, the world is shifting in a completely different direction. SDGs require about five trillion, roughly. You know, rem remittance payments are 400 billion. Double World Bank balance sheet is 50 billion. Okay, I'm not saying it's wrong, but we're talking about different scale. Last figure, don't go into details, I got all the data. Since about three or four years, the Copenhagen Consensus Group here in Washington came up with five Nobel Prize winners and about several dozens of experts with the following figure. What is the return on investment on SDGs and their subtotals? So what do you getting for the dollar? If you put one dollar in there, what are you getting out of it? And the interesting part is, about two thirds of the SDGs are global commons, or related global commons, and their sub goals. And what you come up is that the return on investment on these global commons and their sub targets is enormous. None, nobody here in the room doing business is able to create a return on investment of 1 to 20, 1 to 50, 1 to 100, or even more in his own private business. So what you're having here is a sleeping giant of global commons, which should be awakened. Why is financing the future such a complicated topic? Okay, we're talking about five trillion. But if you look closer to it, you're operating within a system which is empirically very unstable. IMF, World Bank figures, two years ago, we're talking about 420, 25 to 430 currency crisis, state failures, banking crisis over the last 30 years, which makes 10 events a year. Would you sit in your car, if your car breaks down 10 times a year, what would you think if your car breaks down 10 times a year? Would you say, Lauren, you're a bad driver all the time? Say shit. <laughs> you would probably say there's something wrong with the design to begin with. And this system is extremely resistant to change. We have multiple empirical lock-ins, like the subsidies the taxation systems, the carbon bubble. They prevent us from a real change. And time is not on our side. If we continue business as usual, or like wait and see, you can show empirically that it would take roughly three generations, which means roughly a century to equal gender, to access healthcare to everybody on the planet. This is not a political agenda, 100 years. It's not an agenda. And I want to draw your attention to the fact that about a third of these SDGs and sub-goals are really eligible for private business. Yes, super. Renewables, agriculture, name it. Two-thirds are not. Okay, They're standing out there and do not have enough. And on top of it, we have about a black market system with about a third of GDP transactions being illicit. Misinvoice, fraud, corruption, informal sector, pulling the whole world in a completely different direction. So what's required is probably another mindset to look at the whole topic from the very beginning. We're not B, okay? Now it's getting easy. What? This is the global value chain. Central banks, commercial banking system, real economy of goods and service. And what we're doing since 
decades, at the end of that value chain, we're trying to redistribute money to finance commons, to fees, to taxes, and to philanthropy. We actually, as a vote community, uh, came to the consensus in 1992 in Rio that we're spending 0.7% of the GDP on this stuff. And besides Canadian countries, no country ever achieved the 0.7. But even if we achieve the 0.7, look to the figures. It's 10 times too low to meet the SDGs. So this mechanism, this kind of end of pipe finance, is not a bad thing. But it's too slow, too low, and too brittle to finance our political agenda. If you go into the more detailed debate on how to do it, and to put it one step further, what you see here is a time frame of 9 to 15 years. That's the time frame we're having. If we were in the 90s and would have the same debate, we would come up with completely different financial instruments. But we have 9 to 12 to 15 years time span, roughly. And we have, on the other axis, a $5 trillion bill to meet in liquidity and in purchasing power targeted to these goals. And there's kind of a, a six pack out there. And depending on who are you are representing, which stakeholder you are representing, you're emphasizing a different aspect of it. The major emphasis of the last 10 years since 2008 was put on regulation, right? It's about coming up with the taxonomy, with banking stress tests, or corporate social responsibilities. The EU alone, I can go into this in, deep, in deeper details for two days. Just number one here, regulation. The, EU, the EU has generated over 30,000 pages on regulatory efforts. I can tell you there's not one single person on this planet who knows all the 30,000 pages. <laughs> okay? We think by regulating a broken system, we can get into a better future. It's very unrealistic. The second group is, you step up, is taxation. Huge debate. How many fees, how many taxation, CO2 tax, how much subsidies, uh, subsidies up, tax down, the other way around. They all sterilize each other. If you look at the data, we've discussed it an hour ago, put down the subsidies here, putting up taxes there. It's not a bad debate, but at the end of the day, we're not, we're not gonna get where we want it to go. Third step. Impact funding. If you sit in front of the private equity sector, they're going to tell you we have a lot of money out there, roughly 13 trillion in cash position, or with a negative yield, searching out for purposeful investment. Wonderful. But think it to the end. If we follow the private impact investment strategy only, we will end up in 20 years in the privatized world. And we repeat the Washington Consensus from 1992 of deregulation, privatization, and liberalization with all the mess that followed. I'm not arguing, we are not arguing against private sector involvement. But we gotta be very clear what we're getting. <laughs> Fourth strategy the so-called X-swap strategy hybrids. You know, if you possess, just give you one example, if you possess uh, a coal mine, let's say the Vatican is invested in coal mines and realizes it's actually not a good thing, we gotta get rid of it and gotta go into green investment. What are they gonna do? They're gonna sell the stuff and now they have a green, clean balance sheet. Good for the Vatican not good for the rest of the world because the coal mine is still running. Maybe bad management, which is minor to the one the Vatican has hired in the first place. So what's required is here, not additional derivatives, first, second, third tier, where you hand over the hot potato to one to another. We need an instrument called X-Swap that guarantees 
to exit Fossil by contract and to swap a similar amount of money into the green field. We can talk about it later. The fifth one is about 12, 15 different forms of so-called hybrid PPPs. They're all out there where you blend in uh, philanthropy money and private money and public money if there is some available because most countries are over indebted. But if you take these five steps together, my point is, and our point is an integral, more holistic approach, these five steps require an extremely high global consensus to be achieved. You see? Taxation only for Washington won't work. We need it large scale. And we have to operate within nine to 12 years. So it's extremely likely there will be a residual left of liquidity in order to meet the five trillion within nine years. And how can we do this? The amount of that residual here depends on the global consensus. Assuming there's very little global consensus, the larger the residuum remains of the five trillion. If we are gonna love each other from tomorrow onwards, we don't have to talk about residuum, everything is fine. It's unlikely that you're gonna love each other. <laughs> Except people in this room. <laughs> so what is the empirical evidence for financing or challenging this um, residuum? There's two, a top-down and a bottom-up approach, out there already. The top-down is the CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency Approach. We have about 15 central banks who are operating on an experimental level with CBDCs. 15, okay? If you ask a regulator, it's all about controlling, regulating, and or steering the system with regard to price difference. This is their world. And you have a bottom-up approach. It's twofold. One is the so-called cryptocurrencies approach. There's about 2,300 cryptocurrencies all over the world, currently running or registered. Their world is about investment, speculation, or business. You know? And the purpose of the privatized cryptocurrency scene is basically denationalizing the money system, privatizing the money system. The latest proposal is Libra. Monopolies. Okay. The advantage is that cryptos are highly capitalized. We're talking about 350 to 400 billion dollars already, and um, but it's it's private initiatives, mainly. And we have another bottom-up approach, which is older for decades, in some regions even centuries. The so-called community currency approach. We have all over. 3,400 3, currencies running in parallel to the given system already since decades. Bernard Leotard was working on that field in specific. The time dollar system here in Washington, for example, under Edgar Kahn is one of them. The LED system, local exchange trading system, the barter system, and others. <laughs> they are macroeconomically irrelevant for our topic. But they show something else. They show that a parallel system, a system parallel to the conventional one, works. In Switzerland, they worked over 75 years. It only shows, like the brother writes 100 years ago, we gotta show you that humans can fly. It was not the best way to fly, but it shows it works. Only that. So, when we tried, to accomplish the five trillion, we have to look on a parallel currency approach, changing our mindset. Whether it's a CBDC, a crypto, or community <coughs> currency is a political decision. I have a personal opinion about it, we can discuss it. But it is a different approach in financing our future. And this is the graph you know of, okay? We have the conventional system operating on end of pipe technologies trying to finance SDGs. Okay. Falling short by factor 10. We have a shadow economy feeding in, increasing in tropic sector and cold global bar, uh, bubble. And what would happen if we as a world community decide to have a parallel system? 
by the CBDC, crypto or community currencies, and would have that run through blockchain technology. Why blockchain technology? China, uh, China is converting her whole Lanmindi system with the next 15 months on a blockchain base. Can you imagine for 1.2 billion people? And we are in the public sector operating little field studies with central bankers, fiddling around, okay? Why blockchain in the positive sense? It definitely and shows empirically that it increases the trust and therefore indirectly the social capital in the region of interest. Because it's an agreement. It's an agreement based on a database. It's increasing the transparency of the transactions, okay, and therefore minimizes tax evasion, fraud, and illicit transactions. If it's done in the right way, just consider dual thinking, dual processing, parallel thinking. It can make the overall system much more resilient and it creates something economists cause parita superiority. This is a very rare state societies and economies are in. It's a state which is superior to the given equilibrium. That's the full picture. You know, it's like riding a bike with two wheels instead of a motorcycle. And I think this is the kind of mind shift that's required if we really want to finance SDGs, if we really want to finance our future. Having a parallel, digital, additional currency system with a smart contract built in, allowing to target finance SDGs and generating multiple, almost infinite, positive feedback loops into the conventional system. You can overcome the new normal, I can explain you later. You can steer and stabilize the overall economy whenever there's a banking crash in <laughs> the conventional system. It's gonna create millions and millions of green jobs. It, it causes something called inverse trafficking from the shadow economy into the green economy because it's the green economy that's gonna generate the jobs, not the shadow economy. It's going to generate additional public revenues in green dollars, not in conventional dollars, which can be feed back into it again and again. And it, it's not a windfall profit. Like you invest in there and then wait what's see, but you create with the technology multiple endless second round effects. Anytime you touch that dollar, you steer the overall society, overall economy towards a greener, fairer, and more sustainable future. This is a graph you don't know because it's coming out of my working group. It's not the UN, graph, but it's just adopted to it. You know, if you ask people what are the solutions for SDGs, what are the solutions for a better world? And some say, well, we need other technology. Others say we need geoengineering. Others say, oh, we need sinks and renewables. And others say, oh, no, no, we need a lot of lifestyle changes or behavioral changes, and cultural value changes. They're all valid, and we have a lot of data for all of them. But if you're honest, since about 30 years or more, we discussed it with Dennis Meadows a couple of years ago, we've been chronically, not only underestimating, chronically missing, and not debating the design of monetary regulation, design of the financial system itself. It's been, it's been a given, and it's not. This is the Tao Finance Initiative of the World Academy of Arts and Science. It's our proposal how to finance our future. A parallel, additional, regulated, targeted liquidity. It provides a mechanism that is able to shift towards SDGs relatively fast. I'm talking about 18 to 24 months, okay? You can quote me for that time frame. For a lot of goals. 
Whether it's top down or bottom up, whether it's more private or public, is a political decision to make. And at the end of the day, we will realize when we start riding a bike with two wheels, it's much more comfortable than a unicycle, much more stable, much more resilient. But we, at the same time, enter a field where we shifted our mind away from a more patrifocal economy and finance towards a more matrifocal economy, combining the goods of both. I think not implementing this or a very similar mechanism to this will be of huge exponential costs, political and economic costs for the global north. And any wait and see, like, or any business as usual, like, if it was as good, it would have been invented already kind of a thing, right? It's going to be extremely disruptive in the most negative way for us as a world community. And we as WAS would like to invite you that whenever the wind of change is blowing, there's people who are building walls in Europe and also in the United States. And others build windmills. I would like, we would like to build windmills with you. Thank you very much.